Welcome to MCR Labs, um, and thank you for coming to the Edible Talk. Before we get started, I want to tell you guys why we do these talks and um, something about what we do with MCR. So we want cannabis consumers, consumers of cannabis, uh, to get the most out of cannabis and to consume cannabis safely. And we want uh, public perception of cannabis to change and associated laws and policies to change also. Um, for this, sorry. Uh, what, what's most important is for us as a laboratory to do good research and for us as a cannabis community to spread this information to, to the world. And for the last three years as a laboratory, we've been doing a lot of really good research and we're going to continue to do this. And um, as community members, we have two scientists, Scott and Mike, that go to all of the conventions and give speeches at the conventions. They participate at the um, panels whenever they can. Um, we, all the experiments that we do, we try to share them over social media. And right now, a new initiative that we're doing is we started a, uh, we're going to make a book with all of the experiments that we've done so that we can spread this information to the world. And if you want more information about that and how you can make that successful, there's more information in the back. Um, and we do events like this where we invite the best and brightest from our community to talk about what they do best. And that's Adam right there. He's going to do his presentation with <coughs> Scott Churchill that's from the science side. Um, and if you agree with this, if you agree that spreading this information is the best way to move ourselves forward, move, move this community forward, then we ask you to, when this is done, share the video that we're going to have on YouTube and Facebook of this talk, um, and keep spreading this information as you can. About this talk today, first, Scott Churchill, our scientist, is going to talk about Edibles from a science perspective? The regulations for dispensaries, testing labs, all sorts of information. You can get lost in there for weeks looking at all the information they have, and it does cover that. But they're the ones who created it. And what they did was they looked for existing information uh, as best as they could find it. They leaned heavily on the American Herbal Pharmacopeia monograph on cannabis, and they looked at uh, the USP, just general guidelines specifically with like residual solvents and so forth. Residual solvents are used in the making of pharmaceutical products. So there was already a bunch of information on what the allowable limit should be in the finished product. And when and where they could find precedent, that's where they that's where they went. Yes. Are you guys using it looks like you're using QR codes for your test. That's a QR code. Or yeah. Yeah, yeah. You just use your smartphone and that will take you to the website. So if you're curious about a uh, particular uh, product that has a QR code, you can directly access the, uh, the website. And the website has a dose calculator for, you know, if you have a, a, a particular strain and you want to achieve a, a, a dose of that strain, it, it's linked to the report, so when you go to that page, all you do is say, what is your desired dose? And you type it in, and it tells you how much you should consume. So the way this happens a lot of times is, in the pharmaceutical industry, the sponsor of a drug product candidate will do those studies. And um, they'll have all the information, and then once they've reached a certain stage of development, they'll then publish the data. And prior, and it's part of their FDA package too to show what's happening and how it's guided their formulation approach and so forth. With cannabis, what I've seen a lot of are academic and other countries and a couple of like uh, industrial companies like GW Pharma. <coughs> so each dosage form has its its assets and liabilities, its benefits and, and liabilities. The, uh, the routes of administration, or ROAs, um, allow for functional and practical flexibility. So does anybody have any ideas where uh, an edible dosage form would be like a bad idea? Yes? Right, so if you can't access uh, medicine through the oral route, you might need a vaporizing um, form. That's a, that's a uh, uh, practical type consideration. And then you have functional considerations too. Um, so for example, if you, um, if you have an acute spasm disorder where 
you know, at any time you could you could have a, a spasm type situation, but it's it's very isolated. Then taking an edible and waiting an hour and a half or two mm -hmm. hours isn't exactly the, the optimum approach. And if you only need it to act for 15 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes or two hours, uh, taking an edible that can be in your system for 15 hours isn't uh, a good approach. So you have to try and think about all of the different practical um, and functional aspects of this. I think the, the physicians tend to focus um, or be best at guiding on the the functional side of it, whereas uh, patients and uh, caregivers need to be aware of the practical aspects of it too. Um, I know that if I needed to take a dosage form on a routine basis and I needed to be at a baseline of medicated state, my preference would be something that is slow acting and discreet as compared to something that smells awesome but gets a lot of attention and has to be administered on a regular drumbeat when I might not necessarily be able to administer that often. Um, so there's uh, there's benefits to matching the route of administration with the patient and indica indication that they're trying to treat. Cost effectiveness, appropriate onset, appropriate clearance. Um, I absolutely love edibles, but the clearance is definitely a way to get um, because while the uh, prime effect, the optimal effect is is pretty isolated to you know a, a four to eight hour window. Some of the lingering effects last longer. So there are different times you want to have different clearances. Um, it's a, the appropriate dose is a consideration, and the convenience and practicality. <coughs> and I kind of summarized it in here um, with with edibles uh, kind of attributes, assets, liability. A slow onset doesn't really seem to have. Uh, therapeutically uh, beneficial aspect to it. I'm not aware of a time that it's like I want to take a medicine and wait. It, a liability when uh, a rapid effect is needed like acute pain or spasms or something that needs to be addressed very quickly and uh, for a limited duration. Uh, considerations is low and slow titration so someone becoming familiar with the medicine is going to be less able to uh, quickly identify the effect dosage. Like it's not um, like a bottle of aspirin that says take two of these, you know, every four hours or whatever. Uh, with cannabis, you need to um, basically experiment your way to the appropriate dosage. And there's some reasons why I think that's important that you that you go to the. Hi, hey, hi, Abusa. Um, uh, the, you go to that minimum level of effectiveness. And I don't have any scientific data on this, but it's a consideration that's been replaying in my mind. And that is your endocannabinoid system can be pushed uh, with uh, phytocannabinoids. You could put in a bunch of phytocannabinoids and push it in a direction to achieve a therapeutic effect. But if you constantly peg it as far as you can go, it's going to become increasingly difficult to get that uh, therapeutic effect. So if, if you're trying to treat someone, something, some indication, it's always a good idea to go to the minimum level that you achieve that effectiveness. So slow and slow titration, you're not going to know full effect until uh, sometime down the road. It depends on the person. It could be 30 minutes, it could be two hours. Um, Long-lasting attribute, uh, infrequent dosing, uh, may not suit lifestyle needs. It, it can be... Um, the next day can be rough for me if I eat an edible. I could be overly relaxed and I need, might need to be overly energetic and stand and deliver. So there might be times that uh, uh, an inhalation route, which is going to clear a lot quicker and the side effects are going to clear, clear a lot quicker, that might be indicated based on different aspects of your lifestyle. Um, so plan for the duration there. 11 hydroxy THC, does everybody know what that is? The structure of a molecule determines the function that it has. So if you put 11-hydroxy-THC in you, it could just be a slight change of just one group and you get a completely different effect or a subtly different effect or anywhere along the spectrum. So it's a different um, therapeutic effect and it has different attributes. Um, it has increased hallucinogenic effects, again, something that I prefer to be awake for. And uh, 
you need to keep in mind that these are different effects. So uh, we're going to look a little bit at PK and uh, talk about it some more there. Nice thing about it is it's discrete, the privacy. Uh, the liability is accidental exposures. Uh, when I go away for two weeks and I have somebody look after my cat and I'm not careful about labeling my brownies, they might fondly remember that I'm a good brownie maker, but maybe they were unmedicated brownies. They have a couple and then all of a sudden they're having an unwanted effect. Uh, the other thing too is pets and kids might not differentiate. So you have to exercise a great deal of responsibility when you're dealing with edibles, more so than with the cannabis itself, because with the cannabis itself, for the most part, people are going to be keyed in what they're dealing with. Whereas with a brownie or a cookie or, oh my goodness, there are cookbooks out there of the different options, candies and so forth. So you have to, um, you have to be extremely responsible. <coughs> So I made a whole slide about being extremely responsible. Um, it's, it, you know, this goes for all medicine. Uh, you should really, uh, medicine is having a pharmacological effect on, on you. And you should really only take as much as you need. Outside of that, if you're doing a recreational thing, that's an adult decision that you have to make. But you have to, you have to make that uh, in, in an informed manner. And where edibles cross the line is sometimes they look like a treat. So it, it gra gathers in extra uh, consideration. Um, there's no known lethal dosage of cannabis right now. They've tried. Uh, they haven't gotten there. It does not mean that you're not going to have an extremely bad situation. And that comes into play, uh, especially with <laughs> kids, pets, unsuspecting people. Uh, it could happen with uh, people who are compromised. And it can happen with naive patients that come to you for help. If you're working at a dispenser or your caregiver or just a cannabis professional, if if cannabis can positively impact their life in a meaningful way, and they have a bad experience with it, they might not go back to it, or they might not take it the correct way going forward, and that could negatively impact their well-being on an ongoing basis. So, um, if you're if you're trying to make your own edibles, um, you have to be extremely careful with. Um, how you uh, compose it, the, uh, the dosage levels, so that you're not uh, screwing yourself up or someone that you're trying to treat. You have to have the right dosage. It has to be a consistent dosage. It has to be something that's predictable. You have to use uh, extremely good uh, sanitation habits because it's something you're going to be eating. Uh, you're not going to be cleaning it with a, a lighter or anything like that. You're just going to be consuming it as is. So storing the medicine appropriately, uh, having the right sanitation procedures. Uh, if you're going to be buying from, uh, you know, uh, a, a dispensary that doesn't need to test or uh, a caregiver that doesn't need to test, make sure that it's a trusted source. Make sure that you're going to the best of the best and it's someone that you have a relationship with that you trust that provides you with a consistently good product. If you're going to a dispensary here in Massachusetts, it's going to have to go through this lab before it gets to you, and we're not going to let it get to you in a harmful manner. And the other thing, too, is if you have a, a caregiver who uh, isn't aware that we have testing services, we'll test it for them, too. So, uh, and there are other labs in this state and other states, so it's not really a barrier. Okay? But if you're making it for yourself and you're careful about the, the knowledge... Sorry, can I answer that? Yeah. Just because it's been tested, it's, it's batch testing. If there's something wrong with your edible, even one of the dispensaries that do test with us, that does not mean that it's absolutely safe. You know, we have what should be a representative subsample of their batch of brownies or whatever. It could have passed all the tests, but if you suspect that there's something wrong with it, don't eat it anyway. It's not, you know, just because it passed all the tests, the brownie that they sent to us past all the tests does not guarantee that the brownie that you have from them is safe. You know, if, there's, if you suspect anything at all, don't do it. That's an awesome point. Uh, we don't test every single thing that gets put on the shelf. We test a sample from that that's given to us, and we don't have uh, any input into how the sample is selected or what the, the selection process is in terms of its representation of the uh, batch. 
and even if we did, and even if it was all good, you all heard of the, the what is it, the three second rule? Uh, five seconds. Uh, five seconds. Five seconds. Yeah, there's a 20 second rule out there. There's the accidentally stepped it on rule out there. So he's right. If you have any suspicions, you have to be, uh, you know, vigilant towards that. Um, but if you're if you're making your own, um, it, it at a minimum has to be identified. Everything you have has to be identified with uh, that it's dosed with THC. It's important to dose uh, to accurately put down how many cannabinoids are in there, what cannabinoids are in there, all of that stuff. But most of the cannabinoids aren't um, psychoactive. THC is definitely psychoactive. So at a minimum, everything that you have should be appropriately labeled. And you should uh, make sure that they're secured as best as possible. That means preventing unauthorized access, but also so that it's stored properly. Pharmacokinetics. A big word. Basically, it's just um, describing what happens to a drug, any drug, when it goes into your body, from the time it goes in to the time it comes out. And it's it's primarily concerned with liberation. So liberation is uh, like release studies. Uh, in some cases, it's not particularly meaningful. It depends on the dosage route. For example, you can have slow-acting tablets, and uh, liberation would be a, a major consideration. You can have a bolus IV injection where you just have an IV and they push a dose in you, and then liberation doesn't become meaningful. It really has to do with whether or not the introduction has any delay in it. Uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, they apply to pretty much every drug that you deal with. Talking about, um, you know, is it, does it partition into places and hide there and wait there and then slowly release? Is there, how does it distribute throughout the body as a function of time? These are all things that are a function of time. Uh, metabolism, what happens to it? Well, de delta 9 THC, as John pointed out, becomes 11 hydroxy THC because the liver tags it. And it happens predominantly with the, uh, with the edibles as compared to the inhalation route because in the inhalation route, it gets distributed to the, the brain and the heart and the lungs and systemically prior to going through what they call first pass metabolism, which is what happens when you eat an edible. The first pass metabolism really tags everything, everything that goes through at a very high rate. So the, the majority of it becomes metabolized right away. But fortunately for us who enjoy the effects of cannabis, the metabolite, 11 hydroxy THC, um, is still active. Dose, how much is given, uh, the dose interval, how often it's given, the route of administration, whether it's that injection through IV, whether it's inhalation, a tablet, uh, any of those, a patch even. Uh, the C max is the peak amount that's achieved in, in plasma. That means if they draw your blood at a specific time, the, 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 the C max is the time when it has the most of the active ingredient in it. Uh, T max is the uh, is the time and the area under the curve is very important because that is essentially how much total exposure you have to the drug. Um, this is a, a chart that uh, shows two different uh, routes of administration against each other. Now oftentimes uh, this would be indicative when, when I used to do PK studies in pharmaceuticals um, uh, this would be a very a very common uh, looking chart, the red one. You would see it very quickly achieve maximum and then very quickly start to leave and then kind of tail at the end. Um, when you're looking at edibles, um, you see that they kind of go very slowly, don't even reach maximum in this particular study, right? We don't know what the formulation was. We don't know what the patient was. There's a lot of factors that play into this, but we get a max around six but if you look at the, the therapeutic window, if you, if you could actually see the numbers here, the level at approximately 10 milligrams is about 15 hours. So um, it just kind of illustrates when you're looking at this and you're thinking about dosage forms, let's say you need a constant state of it, then your dosage regime would be every four or five hours, right? Because you would get full clearance 
and then you would need to dose again, full clearance, dose again. If um, so, you would you would want to take into account all of these factors to figure out the most appropriate uh, route of administration and the appropriate dosage form. The other considerations that was on the slide. So, in summary, science is cool, right? We've got charts, we've got laboratories, we have a good time. Um, cannabis therapy has diverse applications. There's it, there's a whole bunch of stuff that hasn't been explored yet about a thousand of what people are taking for acute care um, as a potential um, way to prevent illness in the first place. Barely scratch the surface of it. There's a lot of people that are doing that anyway, but uh, very low microdoses. When I was researching cannabis a couple of years ago, I was reading a book on drugs of natural origin. And um, you know, it started off with terpenes, and then it went to cannabinoids, and then it went to vitamins, and then it went to uh, larger molecules that are the, basically the precursors for um, the uh, large molecules that our bodies make. And when I was thinking about it, <coughs> with terpenes, those are used as a, a, a wellness enhancer with uh, you know, countries that recommend uh, what they call Shinrin Yoku or forest bathing, where you go out and expose yourself to forested areas that have a prevalence of, uh, of these <coughs> terpene compounds. And what they found is that when they, they measure the um, blood pressure and heart rate and other diagnostic features, they find that uh, people actually get a benefit from being exposed to these chemicals. Now, I'm not um, an expert on the individual studies, but everything I saw said that they controlled for just going outside and walking by separating classes into forested areas and non-forested areas. Now, of course, they can't separate it from the sounds and the sights and that sort of thing, but there seems to be uh, some evidence that being exposed to phytonutrients is beneficial in and of itself. And does everyone in here take a, a multivitamin? Yes. Those have a pretty good reputation. Vitamins have a pretty good reputation of maintaining proper health. Um, so there could be there could be uh, future applications of just a health maintenance and prevention of disease type uh, thing, and then there's the uh, managing and uh, treating symptoms of illness, and there may even be uh, you know potential cures in the future, cures of illness. So a lot of different applications. Uh, the, like I said, the pharmacokinetic data that is available on a lot of different drugs, including um, the cannabinoids, can help um, physicians and patients tailor it to their needs. And the, the main considerations with responsibility around cannabis-infused edibles is preventing accidental do dosage, preventing accidental overdosage, using smart techniques when making edibles, and using sanitary practices at all times, throughout the process. You've made your edibles, you've packaged your edibles. They have to be, uh, remain treated with uh, the right amount of respect and, and protection from uh, contamination or degradation. So before I hand it over to a break, are there any questions based on what I talked about? Yes? Is there any way to ensure that your edibles are homogenized and make a batch? Problem. That is a, a big consideration, and uh, people have taken different approaches to it. And I'm not an edibles maker, so I'm not particularly uh, sophisticated with it. You might want to ask that one again at the end because there may be someone who knows more about this than me. But some people have attempted to add the dose portion to individual servings, which is not. Um, particularly useful for like industrial applications, but for the patient who's trying to create their own therapeutics, it might be a, a way to minimize the variation. Uh, you know, having, a, having a, a, a stable supply of consistent potency product that you individually dose carefully um, is one way to do it. Um, there are probably others depending on the recipes you're using and the starting materials. Good question, though. Very important. 
on the industrial application, it would be designing experiments that could give you statistical data that would tell you what sampling regime would uh, result in being able to capture a high degree of confidence, confidence degree chosen of uh, representation of the sampling so that you can do a minimal of sampling but be confident in the, the results that they apply to the back. Yes? Um, I have two questions. One, do you guys test all, every batch of every edible that every dispensary makes. So like every batch of brownies, like if they make a batch of brownies on Monday and Wednesday, you know, are you, you're testing basically every... I don't know exactly what their requirements are and how the batches are broken up. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what other labs might be contributing to the testing effort. So it is, there is a possibility that um, another lab may do a particular test. Um, so, but in terms of like what is the batch size and what constitutes the batch, I don't particularly admit. That's put forth by the DPH Mike might know. Yeah, but since we get to this Sure, it's, it, the, each dispensary is um, going to have to decide what they call a batch. The regulations state that a batch is making the same materials at the same time, but whether at the same time means during that week, or during that day, or during an hour, is really up to each R&D, each dispensary. Um, it just depends on what you put into the software, the tracking software um, at the dispensary level. Um, you just see a sample of it. As the and then what's your, what's your turnaround? Because so, I'm thinking of like something with like a baked good, you know, it's like you bake it. It's, you know, it depends it, on the tests that you want and on the volume of testing that we have at, at the moment. But we generally turn them around within, within two to five business days. What's your margin of error? What's your accuracy? Uh, ah, that's a good question. Uh, so, so it's going to depend on every matrix, right? So, whenever we have a new batch in that you have you know, mom's special recipe that has a secret ingredient that's really messing with the chromatography, it'll be worse. It'll take longer. It'll generally it won't be worse because we can tell that something is wrong. We test it a bunch of times to get a nice average and to build confidence, but it. it it does depend on the matrix. So, so whenever we have something like that come in, what our accuracy is is going to be determined also by but is it is it a problem with our accuracy or with the margin of the sample? Sure. Or I wouldn't even call it a problem. It's just something that we have to differentiate. And generally, our testing has come in where the error in our tests is less than the spread in actual product samples. Right, so the, there's going to be an homogeneity in the sample that is larger than the spread of our results. Are, are you testing with gas chromatography or liquid? Or? Depends on the test. Okay. So for cannabinoids, it's like chromatography because that doesn't require heating the, the sample, so we can differentiate between tetrahydrocannabinol tetra acid and tetrahydrocannabinol, tetra which you can't do. With juice. I hope everybody knows that one of one of the things that happens to overcooked brownies makes you sleepy. Does everyone know why? CBN. CBN. CBN production. So even if you go at a low and slow temperature, if, if you give it long enough access or you give it the right opportunity with subsequent processing or other uh, ingredients that are added, you can contribute towards you know, changing the, the, the chemical profile of the sample. <clears throat> I run a company called Purist Labs, uh, which is a mobile extraction and refinement lab. Um, and I recently started a company called Vibe, uh, which is an effect specific uh, edibles company, essentially. Um, so basically, we're looking to take cannabis formulations, cannabinoids, terpenes, and formulate them into very effect specific formulations. So 
much like vitamin water provides, you know, relaxation, energy, focus, sleep, we plan on doing that with cannabis, um, entire cannabis compounds, so cannabinoids, terpenes, the whole nine yards. Um, so I've been testing with these guys for as long as these guys have been here, pretty much, um, and they've helped me out quite a bit with all my techniques, all my workflow, all my formulations. So um, I think we've kind of learned a lot from each other over the last uh, couple of years. So I want to talk to you guys about sort of my take on edibles and you know where I started in you know as an amateur first doing it at home. I was a chef for 10 years, so I was doing edibles for other chefs and cooks and stuff like that. So in the kitchen, you know, edibles are a really discreet way to consume. And everybody knows that cannabis is kind of a performance enhancing drug for chefs and cooks. There's a way to do it precisely and there's a way to do it, um, you know, honestly. Uh, because cannabis, you're dosing yourself basically. So you want to know how much you're putting in down to the milligram. So uh, super important. So I think my first slide we're talking about, so this is decarboxylation. This is something that Scott talked about. Um, and I know they did a whole talk about decarbing here too, so I'll kind of keep it short. Why is decarbing necessary? So on the plant, uh, you have THCA, um, which is the acidic form of THC, basically. So it's not psychoactive. So if you were to just take a plant, cut it down, and munch on it, you wouldn't get stoned. You'd get you know medicinal benefits that THCA offers. Um, Things like, you know, it does offer pain relief, some anxiety relief, inflammation relief, um, but it doesn't offer, you know, the feeling of calm that you get from eating an edible that's been decarboxylated into THC Delta 9. Um, so primarily it's, it's necessary to activate it, like I said, so you get the effect, so you get the full benefits. Um, THC, not psychoactive, but there's still plenty of, you know, medicinal benefits that I think are coming about that people are learning about. Um, some people like THC because they really don't like the psychotropic effect, but they like the uh, other effects that it provides. Um, so you're starting to see now edibles on the market that uh, aren't active. They're, they have their acidic components left intact. Um, some people don't want to be stoned. They just don't, or they can't deal with it. So, so THC is, is a good alternative. It's a good method of consuming uh, without having to worry about the psychotropic effects. Um, a lot of times I get questions about CBD. Do you guys know what CBD is? So CBD is one of the cannabinoids that uh, has extreme medicinal benefits, but is not psychotropic at all. It's not psychoactive. Um, it doesn't get you stoned, uh, but it has incredible anxiety relief benefit and pain relief benefit. It's kind of a really good intro to uh, cannabis as a proper medicine, as a pure medicine. Um, so CBD is becoming more and more popular these days. So a lot of people ask me if they have access to high CBD strains. Do you have to decarb that? Um, in general, I treat it the same way as THC, so I say, yeah, you should probably decarb it. Uh, CBDA in its acidic form has benefits, um, but CBD, uh, once it's active, seems to have much stronger, uh, much stronger benefit. Um, I use it for anxiety relief myself, so I consumed a large dose of CBD before I came here. I don't have to sit in front of you guys, and uh, it's kind of giving me, you know, more focus than I otherwise would have, so. Um, and to make it seem like I did more work on this presentation, I think I'm going to take questions in line to stretch it out a little bit. So if you guys have any questions, like, while I'm going, I'm probably going to stop slide by slide, ask you guys if you have any questions about what I'm talking about right now. So are there any questions on decarboxylation? So you do decarb CBD? I do decarb CBD, for sure. For sure. Your evidence is anecdotal that it's better? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of all anecdotal, you know, because it's, uh, you can't really do clinical studies on this stuff, so there's, there's not a ton of data besides sort of the anecdotal. Um, but yeah, it seems, you know, for, for me, who consumes quite a bit of it, it seems much more beneficial decarb than in its acidic form. When we distill all of our concentrates, um, similar to like what you've seen, like the clear concentrate, basically it's a distilled concentrate, so it's, um, it's actually decarboxylated during the distillation process. And the cool thing about that is it's a totally efficient decarboxylation process, so you're left with no THCA and no degraded CBN. Because, I mean, like we were talking about earlier, um, you take it over, if you decarb too much, you start, you start developing CBN. Do you guys know about CBN? So CBN is basically the degrade, it's THC when it degrades. So you, you get it, you know, 
you get to a point where you're decarbing from THC A to THC, and then there's a peak at which if you keep heating that, it starts degrading to a different cannabinoid called CBN. And uh, pure CBN, as far as I know, is very mildly psycho psychoactive, if psychoactive at all, but it's an incredibly strong sedative. Uh, so it's one of the best sleep meds money can buy. So that could be, so that could be a desirable effect for sure. So, so what I so what I've noticed is um, most of my experience is in decarb uh, decarbing concentrates. So generally, what I've seen is taking it up to somewhere between 140 and 180 C. You're getting a pretty efficient decarboxylation where you've destroyed all the all the acidic components. And now you're left with, you know, pure delta nine. Basically, if you continue with those temps, there's a curve over a couple hours where it starts to break down. Basically, so 140 to 150 C. I would say about three. What is that? About 310, 320 Fahrenheit. Um, so yeah, no, it works great. Like I, I have a sleep disorder, so CBN works wonders. I've also found that if you just keep it in a certain temperature for a long time, for sure. Yep. Absolutely, right, right. Yep. No, exactly, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I mean, when I first started, uh, when I first started just making edibles in my house, I mean, I didn't understand the difference. It, it was Mike and Scott that kind of taught me the difference in the lab. And because I noticed, you know, giving this stuff to chefs who, you know, we used to live on espresso, basically, so we used to live on iced coffee and keep going, they would say, okay, your edibles would just put me right to sleep. Like, great sleep, you know? So, it's interesting. There's a lot of anecdotal studies that will tell you, like, it's really good sleep med, you know? Um, what kind of concentrates do you tend to use? Like, are you using, like, a BH or a Rosin sure. or a Wax or a No, it's a good question. So, so when I first started, I was sourcing, essentially, BHO from the open market, you know? Because that was kind of what was most readily available in the Northeast. You get slabs of BHO floating all over the place. So I would take it, I would decarb it, and then I would make my edibles. But in doing so, you're kind of basing, you're kind of assuming a lot. You're kind of assuming like, okay, what's the potency of this starting material? So unless you know that, it's really hard to accurately dose. So I basically came into a situation where, you know, I test my edibles for these guys, and it'd be way off. And I'd say, okay, I think I'm pretty good at dosing, but you know, I know nothing about the, the input, so I know nothing about the starting concentrate. So if you have the ability to test, you know, what you're cooking with before you cook with it, it's definitely the best way to, to go about doing things. It kind of slows down your process, but, um, so when I first started, I was using BHO. Um, I have a lab in Rhode Island where I purchased a, a supercritical CO2 extractor. So I'm doing um, CO2 extracts down there. And then I have a business where we do ethanol extraction, uh, and then another where we do actually extraction using mineral oil. And then we, distill the cannabinoids out of the mineral oil. So it's, you know, but in making edibles, you can start with any kind of input. That's the cool thing. So flour, make your own butter, you know, you buy some BHO, you buy some rosin, as long as you can decarb it. And, you know, if you have a rough idea as to what the potency is, then, you know, you can dose stuff pretty close, um, especially if it's for yourself, you know. What do you think is best to use, like, versus BHO, rosin, coconut oil? Well, it's hard to say. It's kind of subjective, you know, because I've had some extremely high quality BHO. I've had extremely low quality BHO. I've had very high quality rosin. I've had very low quality rosin. So it's really, it really comes down to who's making it, how they're making it, how they treat it, you know what I mean? Um, but for me, what I work with in, uh, in most of my situations is uh, the distilled product. Um, it's odorless, it's flavorless, um, it's upwards of 90 plus percent potent. So doing your dilutional math for your edibles is a little bit easier, you know, with a, with a higher potency. Um, and I just like the fact that it's totally odorless and flavorless because it's it's the ultimate sort of in uh, discrete consumption. You know, I'm sorry. Um, to speak on like the, the odorless flavorless, um, so at that same time you're losing the terpenes, which yeah. I, Absolutely. No, that's a good that's a good point. So when we distill, there's a couple ways we can go about it. So uh, to do it on a very quick uh, sort of industrial basis, we treat the terpenes as a waste product. And that's a good point. So we completely degrade them 
to the point where they smell unrecognizable, they taste unrecognizable. So it's nothing that we want to put back into the product. Now we have methods of pre-treating the product before we distill it that can siphon off terpenes um, in, a, in a less degraded way, in a more kind of natural way. So using freeze drying or using super or subcritical CO2, we can capture this terpene profile, further purify it and add it back in. It's a little bit of, it's kind of like, you know, from a science standpoint, it's like, well, why would you do that if you have a full plant extract? And that's that's the question I get most often, basically. Like an enriched weed versus the right. original. Totally. And so you'll notice that, you know, you consume my products, which are made with the distillate, which are completely free of terpenes. Um, it's an entirely different effect than what you would get from consuming an edible that, you know, is modulated with those terpenes. So, you know, most people describe it as kind of like the ultimate sativa sort of high, sativa effect. Um, it seems like unmodulated THC is a very kind of like energetic, maybe a little paranoid high, you know, like we used to get when we were younger. Um, but you start modulating it with, and this kind of brings me to, to my latest venture, which is my new business, um, but you start modulating the individual cannabinoids with specific terpenes. So like, for instance, if you just mix, you know, my distilled product with Mercy, now all of a sudden you've turned it into a more of an indica type of effect. Something like Mercy, which is more responsible for that couch locky, relaxation, like no paranoia type effect. Um, versus if you mix it, so you take pure THC, there's all types. So like, an interesting one is Neurolidol. So if you take, you know, pure THC and mix it with something like Neurolidol, now you have a very focused high, almost like like an Adderall type effect, which is pretty cool, you know. So all these terpenes, you know, and they talk about it as being the entourage effect. We don't really know exactly what's going on. I'm sure Scott could speak to it better than I could because I think a lot of it is, is the pharmacokinetic aspect. Um, but it's cool how it changes, you know, like instantaneously, like, you know, from a super paranoid anxious high to... Uh, I just want to be in bed, I'm totally chill all day type of high. And all it takes is maybe, you know, less than 1% of a, of a terpene to modulate that effect. So it's pretty cool. Um, so what I'm doing right now basically is taking these specific formulations, THC, CBD, CBN, um, and different mixtures with different terpenes uh, to really kind of just create these effect specific products. So, you know, a formulation that's pure relaxation, a formulation that's pure sleep, a formulation that's focused, and a formulation that's energetic. And this is all achievable using the constituents of cannabis, which is cool. Because it's not just indigo versus sativa, which is what it used to be, but I feel like we've kind of graduated beyond that, and now we're looking more into higher resolution formulations. Like, how do we provide people with, you know, not just uppers and downers, but very kind of specific effects. Um, so it's pretty cool. I think that's kind of where the industry's heading, maybe. Um, but for right now, we, uh, we're kind of just testing it amongst a group of known consumers, basically, just to get whether, whether it be positive or negative feedback. But we're also not really making like any egregious claims saying that we, we guarantee any specific effect. And sort of looking at, um, and sort of looking, at, looking at the patient base of different RMDs that are currently open, uh, I think we're all very surprised as to like who who makes up the largest part of the patient base. We're seeing a lot of elderly people. We're seeing a lot of legitimately sick people. And we're seeing, which is very interesting, just a lot of first-time consumers. Um, so there's a huge sort of educational piece to you have an ailment, what product is going to help you with that ailment? Or if you desire a certain effect, what product is going to most likely help you attain that effect? So. Um, so yeah, there, there's plenty of medicinal benefit as well. So in talking about decarboxylation, uh, a lot of people ask, how do you do it? Um, and there's a lot of different techniques depending on what your starting material is, basically. So you know, the simplest and what I started with, and I'm sure what everybody starts with, is uh, either ground up flour or ground up trim. And how do you decarb it in order to make uh, an infusion that you can then cook with? Um, it's pretty simple, and there's you know a good technique that I found that leads to a really efficient decarboxylation. Like I said, meaning no, th no acidic THC left, no CBN 
you know, due to degradation. Um, is really just, you know, kind of grinding it coarsely. You know, you start with very dry material, you grind it pretty coarsely. Uh, you can spread it thin onto a baking sheet, onto just a cookie tray, and cook it in your oven uh, at about 240 to 250 Fahrenheit. Um, and you can do it for as little as an hour. The hotter you go, the quicker it is, but then you run the risk of degrading it to CBN, which may be something you're looking for. Once you hit that peak, um, you know, generally what I found at, you know, the conventional temperatures of what most people are baking at, it's going to take a really long time to then degrade that into CDN. Even at 350, 375, you're talking hours and hours and hours uh, before you start to see any, any noticeable degradation. A couple different easy ways to decar. Um, now, now what if you have a... Uh, what if you have a concentrate? So let's say you have a bunch of uh, even either rosin or BHO or somebody gave you CO2 oil or whatever you have. Uh, what I found is really just the most efficient way is to heat it up very quickly. And I know it's kind of contrary to a lot of people thinking you kind of want to bring it up slow. You're driving off a lot of those volatiles because that's essentially what you're doing. You're driving off water. But there's a way to do it very quickly. And I found that doing it like on an induction burner in you know, a steel bain marie or pot. Uh, you get it up to 180C or 355 Fahrenheit as quick as you can, pull it off the heat. Then you have a pretty efficient decarb. You've, you've removed all the acidic compounds, there's no THCA. Uh, you haven't, it hasn't been left on there long enough to degrade into CBN. So that's how I used to do it when I was kind of sourcing concentrates from the open market and just buying slabs, heating it up, cooking with it, repeat. It seemed to work pretty well. Um, it smells like shit, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend doing it when your family's home or if your neighbors are very paranoid about uh, what you do, what you are doing. It's not a very discreet way of decarving. It's kind of like you're degrading all these aromatic compounds into something that smells like you wouldn't believe, for sure. Um, so, you know, all of these things, even if you bake it in the oven, it's something to consider. It's not very discreet. Uh, sous vide is probably, if you have the means to do it, it's probably the most discreet way to do it. Um, yeah, so just even touching upon CBN, CBN may be a desired thing. Um, you may want CBN. Uh, if you suffer from any kind of sleep issues, like I'm sure a lot of us do, CBN is an incredible sleep med, for sure. Better than melatonin, better than Ambien, no lingering side effects, no hangover the next day. So if you have the ability to kind of overdo it, then, and you want that, then overdo it and create some CBN, you know. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, you can put just buy swag. Very yeah. heavy, we used to buy a lot of brick weed from Cali, yes. for sure. And brick weed used to pretty much come pre d cards. <laughs> Sometimes it would come with like bottle caps and other stuff in it too, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. oh yeah. I can't tell you the amount of pounds that I've run that it looked like lawnmower clippings and it had Pacifico bottle caps in it and no <laughs> you could tell like but no smell, no flavor. Yeah. Right, exactly. So pretty good for edibles and pretty good for sleepy time edibles for sure. Um, but a lot of that stuff comes from like several year old humble crops which we found out. Um, so some common homebrew infusion techniques. I want to talk about that because now that I kind of talked about decarbing, what do you do with it? If you don't mind flavor, if you don't mind texture, you can eat a handful of it and it'll do what you want it to do. Um, but if you really like the flavor of things and you know you want to eat some delicious food and make some delicious food that's infused, uh, probably the most common thing people do is make butter. You know, um, And that's kind of where we all started in a very rudimentary way, I'm sure, just taking butter when our parents were out of town and blasting a bunch of cannabis in there and cooking the hell out of it until it looked like it would get you stoned. And then you make some brownies or whatever. And leave the leaf in there and everything. Everything. Yeah, everything. Strain it. In there. Yeah. You didn't care. You know, you didn't care. But now I feel like we're a little more grown up, we're a little more mature, so we kind of care now. Yeah, exactly. It smelled like you were drinking, or tasted like you were drinking bong water. You know, and some people's edibles still kind of do. You know? But if you really care about the flavor and you're a little bit fancy yourself, more of a gourmand, then, you know, there's ways to do it properly. Um, cooking, you know. Uh, or infusing butter with decarboxylate plant material is super easy. And it's a very, like any kind of fat, uh, is a very efficient uh, infusion mechanism or extraction mechanism, basically. Um, so, I mean, honestly, you could take decarboxylated material and kind of simmer it in butter for as little as a half hour, and you almost get a pretty full extraction at that point. 
what I've seen. Um, you can use olive or vegetable, you know, uh, evu or vegetable oil. Uh, coconut oil is a really popular one. Um, coconut oil seems to really, I mean, when I first got started, coconut oil seemed to really produce the best effects. It's RSO, um, which is an uh, acronym for Rick Simpson oil. He's the Rick Simpson, the guy that kind of, you know, came up with this technique. And it's, um, it's essentially what it is, a whole plant extract using alcohol, and then you cook. Generally, you know, his technique was to cook all the alcohol out of it. Some people do that, some people don't, depending on what the application is. But then essentially what RSO is, is an alcohol-based extract, or a concentrate. So, depending on the quality of it, it could be a dab quality extract, or it could be really shitty. I've seen some really bad RSOs, like really just like hanging out in you know, alcohol. Um, it really does stink your place up, so it's, it might not be something you want to do if you have a whole family kind of hanging out with you. Um, I've known people to make vegetable glycerin tinctures, so glycerin or propylene gly uh, glycol works really well for this as well. Um, but uh, veg glycerin, you know, if you have decarboxylated material, you can uh, put it in your crock pot with some vegetable glycerin and it kind of slowly starts to infuse in the glycerin. And now you have a essentially an invert sugar, which you can turn into a hard candy, you can infuse that into a drink. So some people make tinctures that they just put on their tongue. And you can vape it, exactly, yep, yep, veg glycerin or, or propylene glycol generally is uh, what you see in most vaporized cartridges, vaporizer cartridges. You know, the glycol is a much better solvent for the cannabinoids than the, than the, the vegetable glycerin is. But the, vegetable, the sweetness of the vegetable glycerin cuts the bitter flavor of the glycol. So that's why people use it in their e-juices. And so that's essentially a tincture that people are putting in their cartridges. Um, and so you could take a similar tincture and, and dose drinks with it if you wanted to. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a decent way to do it, but you kind of need that. The, gly the glycerin doesn't work great by itself without the glycol. And you see that when you're filling cartridges too. You'll notice that it can separate if you don't have enough glycol in there. Um, so that's, I think, a problem a lot of people run into. But the last two seem to be you know, if you're not too picky about it or obsessed about it, then you can, you can, you know, dose your morning coffee pretty, pretty hot and heavy with glycerin tincture or alcohol tincture, and it works great. Much to the same degree that consuming an edible, like the onset is really contingent on your body chemistry, what you consume before you consume that edible. Um, a lot of processed foods have a lot of emulsifiers in them, so what I've noticed with patients over the years, like they would eat one of my edibles after pounding like some fast food and the onset would come on faster, um, they reported. Um, and my guess is because of the emulsifiers, the, the starches, the fillers. Um, so soy lecithin I've noticed works really well. Uh, in Quincy I'm making uh, like gel caps, like coconut oil based gel caps for consumption. We have seen sort of these other constituents of cannabis isolated from THC and purified very heavily. They really do kind of take the edge off and make it a little more palatable. Maybe not make you instantly sober, like you kind of sometimes want to be, but it at least takes like the paranoia away from it and the feeling like the whole room's spinning and it's about to collapse in on you and all that, you know? Um, and it's interesting, you see that a lot of cannabinoids, <coughs> most of the cannabinoids in our THC work to sort of counteract the psychotropic effects and like the really edgy effect of THC. Uh, a lot of the terpenes do as well. Some of the terpenes work to make you know, even more of a paranoid high. So it's definitely like these blends can do so much, you know, like the modulation of these terpenes with the cannabinoids can do so much. And I think we're just scratching the surface as to how do we take the reins and how do we, act, you know, act like give somebody that's going to give a product to somebody that's going to give them the desired effect and not feel like they're losing their minds. I'm waiting for the first person to offer like the proper medicated beer. Because I'll bet that happens in the Northeast, either that or SoCal, I don't know. But it's going to happen soon, I'll bet. Um, but I actually used to do, uh, I don't know, kind of in between what I do now and when I was a chef, I used to do a lot of kind of like underground sort of late night pop-up dinners uh, that were medicated multi-course dinners. So we do pretty nice stuff, pretty high-end like fine dining, plated, you know, five, six course dinners. Uh, they were all medicated, all medicated lightly, you know two to five kind of migs per course, and then like a nice medicated cocktail. Um, and this was before I really started really refining, taking the flavor away from it. So I tried to make a lot of really kind of, uh, really full flavored dishes that really did complement, you know, the cannabis did complement the dish as opposed to took away from it. 
Um, for sure. But I think a big thing, you know, if we're looking at a rec market or a big rec market in the Northeast, I think we'll start seeing, um, you know, restaurants with cannabis pairings and stuff like that. At least I hope we do, because I think that would be pretty cool. If we have alcohol pairings, why couldn't we have cannabis pairings, you know? So if you're making stuff for other people, you want to make sure what you're giving them is not dosed, you know, it's not misdosed, it's not underdosed, it's not overdosed. You want to give them that good effect. And it's, it's a very difficult thing to do because um, a lot of people look at an eighth of flour and they say, well, I have 3,500 milligrams of usable product here, but it's not, that's not how it works. You know, you have flour that has a potency. It could be 10% pure, it could be 20% pure, 30% pure, everything in between. So if you have an efficient extraction, now you have a dilution of your cannabinoids in your oil or whatever it is. So I generally never, I don't know, cooked a lot with flour because I couldn't get the dosing down. Um, so when I was using BHO or CO2 concentrate, uh, that's a higher purity, it's a lot more easily dosable. It's a lot easier to kind of do that math and dose. If you have a gram of BHO that's generally testing at 70 to maybe 80 percent, you know, you know that per gram now you have 700 milligrams at 70 percent purity or 800 usable milligrams per gram, essentially. So now your dilutional math is a lot easier. You know, can you guesstimate? Of course, you know, but it's... If you're making claims as to the potency, you kind of want to know where you're getting into. But that's why these guys uh, are such an invaluable resource, because they'll test any of your products. You'll get a better idea for your workflow, what your edibles are testing at, you know. Um, but yeah, your best bet is to kind of have your infusion or your concentrate tested before you cook with it, if you have the opportunity to, for sure. Because then your math is pretty straightforward into your recipe. So. So if you have the ability to, to test your these guys before you kind of make a big batch of, uh, of edibles, then you should do it, for sure. And then uh, I printed out, a lot of people like my gummies. So this is one of my gummy recipes. So if you guys want, we'll pass it out. Um, I'll tell you straight up, this is like the legit Haribo gummy recipe. So if you guys like Haribo gummy bears, you're going to dig this recipe for sure.